Welcome to Boost CYAC's new webinar series. Uh, I'll be hosting the webinar today. Before we begin our session, there are a few quick housekeeping points. Uh, for participants listening in French, click on the floor uh, at the bottom left of the screen and select French. To see and follow along with the PowerPoint presentation in English, click Presentation on the top left of the screen. To follow along with the presentation in French, download the French version of the presentation by clicking on Documents on the right. Feel free to download the presentation in both English and French by clicking on Documents on the right. There will be a question and answer uh, conversation during the last five minutes of the webinar. To submit your question, please go to the toolbar on the right, click on Messaging, and then Participants, and type in your question. You can submit your questions at any time. If you are watching this webinar in a group, please enter the number of participants in the group by clicking on Messaging, and then Participants. Uh, we'll now begin. So. Uh, hello everybody and welcome and uh, thank you to Boost uh, and everybody for inviting me to come along and uh, share some uh, ideas with you, some thoughts uh, about working with people in uh, cases of interpersonal violence and particularly young people. You have my, uh, my bio. Um, I won't add much to that, just to say uh, I work as a therapist and consulting psychologist, particularly around cases of interpersonal violence. So I work with people who've committed violence, people who've been subjected to violence, adults and kids. And my colleagues and I at the Center for Response-Based Practice, uh, the website is on the first page, have been um, working at trying to improve institutional responses in cases of violence for quite a long period of time. So Kathy Richardson, uh, Dr. Kathy Richardson, who's a, a scholar and activist, a Métis, um, former child protection worker, um, has been really involved in child protection practice for many years. And Kathy and I have been working together uh, with Shelley Bonna, who is um, also part of the center team, and Dr. Linda Coates. Uh, and we've been working together uh, looking at police responses, court responses, media, criminal codes, uh, so on and so forth. So we combine practice and research, and we find that... Um, both feed one another. So it's a bit weird looking at the screen. I apologize if uh, you're watching me and I'm looking strange, <laughs> but there it is. So um, uh, I'm not sure how much to read going through these present, these PowerPoint points. You can see them. Um, violence is without question the most urgent problem of our times. Um, most people who are diagnosed with serious mental disorders uh, reports significant violence or trauma histories. Um, violence in childhood is the single best predictor of a diagnosis of mental illness in childhood or adulthood. Uh, people uh, living in homelessness and poverty are disproportionately more likely to have endured violence um, prior to living in those conditions and during uh, living in those conditions. And also people, are, people who are living in homelessness and poverty are less likely to receive uh, positive institutional responses. They, on average, tend to have more difficulty obtaining justice from the various systems we have. Um, people who are diagnosed with eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, uh, who are involved in dangerous drug use, so-called self-harming and so on, also tend to report much higher levels of interpersonal violence in childhood. Uh, people involved in uh, prostitution and porn and also involved in using uh, prostitution and porn uh, and human trafficking for various purposes uh, also tend to have much more involvement uh, in interpersonal violence. Um, you, you may know that um, a very high percentage of people involved in so-called sex work uh, or prostitution, 70, 75, 80 percent, depending on the jurisdiction, qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, people involved in criminal activities, uh, about 90% of our prison population, people who are incarcerated, uh, report significant violence histories. And in Canada, 70 to 90% of child protection cases um, in, in Canada involve violence uh, broadly defined. So given the importance of violence to public health, um, to individual and family life, uh, to the performance of people in various roles in their lives, 
you would think that training in interpersonal violence is basic to anyone entering the human services field, whether it's in education, medicine, uh, social work, or what have you. However, when you look at the curriculums of uh, people um, in these various professions, school teachers, medical doctors, lawyers and judges, etc., cetera, um, you find that the medical doctors, for example, receive very little, uh, med many medical doctors, none or virtually no training in understanding interpersonal violence. It's the same for school teachers, lawyers. Uh, I meet regularly with articling students in law schools and talk with them about what kind of training they get in interpersonal violence, and it's slim to none. Social workers might get training in anti-oppressive practice, but on the nuts and bolts of what violence is and how it works and who commits it and how they do it, how people respond to it and how people resist the violence, then how the practices of our institutional actors fit in to the dynamics of those cases, um, very little training. Um, police get, depending on their jurisdiction, um, it, you might get some training at depot if you're an RCMP member. If you're working for a city force, you might get more training. Um, but at, at the early stages of training in depot or basic training, um, training in interpersonal violence tends to be pretty minimal. So it's really almost as though we've created a medical school with no courses in cancer or diabetes. We know that violence is the most urgent problem of our times, and yet virtually all groups of professionals are radically untrained or undertrained. You can get training, of course, post your degree, and many people do, um, but you really have to uh, make it a point to try to get training in interpersonal violence. It's not necessarily automatically provided to any professional group. So when we're looking at, at um, violence and trying to understand it um, in some kind of comprehensive way, what kinds of facts, what kinds of information is important. Um, David Trimble, who's the former co-president of Northern Ireland and was key in um, addressing the so-called troubles uh, in Ireland uh, for many years, said a sense of the unique, specific and concrete circumstances of any situation is the first indispensable step to solving the problems posed by that situation. So facts first, we need to try to get as close to the actions of people on the ground as we possibly can and understand the context around those actions. So here's something like a map. What is context? What parts of the context might be important um, in cases of interpersonal violence? And so this map is built up uh, from our conversations with uh, people over the last 30, 35 years and also from research, uh, various forms of research on child sexualized abuse, sexualized assaults, domestic and family violence, um, uh, and various other forms of violence and abuse. So the context in the life world, you need to know who people are, where do they live, who are they culturally, how do they identify, do they identify as queer, lesbian, trans, uh, do they have work, do they have a vehicle, are they geographically isolated, are they in a relationship, uh, do they have kids, so on and so forth. So, for example, if you're, uh, if you're a woman living in uh, Ross River, Yukon, in a isolated location, uh, you may not have a constant police presence in your community. You're geographically quite isolated, and you know that um, during the week, it might take you two and a half hours to get a uh, member of the police to attend um, a, a serious crime. Uh, just because resources are stretched and so people can't be everywhere uh, at once. So if your partner beats you up and then, as one woman told me, uh, then he wants to, every time he beats me up, he wants to have sex on my body. If you're that woman and your partner's beaten you up and then wants to rape you and you know that it might take police two and a half hours to get there, what are your options in that moment? You have kids in the house, his family lives next door and they think you're a bit of a bitch. Uh, so what do you do? I mean, the option of kicking him in the nuts, uh, screaming and yelling and running out of the house, dragging your kids out of the house to get them away may not be an option because you don't have anyone there to protect you. So he has two and a half hours to beat you even worse. So in that moment, you might have to respond by 
going elsewhere in your mind, going limp in your body to try to get it over with as quickly as possible. In other words, the way in which the victim responds to and resists the violence is tied to the physical and material context in which they live. Geographic location is extremely important. Uh, social and physical isolation is extremely important. In other words, the forms of the victim's resistance are dependent on context. It's not only a matter of their psychological makeup, their family background, uh, so on and so forth. It's also important to understand the social and the physical setting where assaults take place. Um, for example, uh, one couple I spoke with, uh, they were out partying, they came home, they sent the babysitter uh, away, they were inside the front door of their house, and um, they, the one partner started getting very aggressive, uh, yelling and starting to push the other partner. So my first question was, where in the house were you? And uh, they said, well, we're, we're by the front door. Uh, so I said, well, what, what's near the front door in your house? Uh, the stairs that go upstairs, that's where the bedrooms are. That's where the kids were sleeping. So when your partner started assaulting you, um, getting aggressive with you, how did you respond in that moment? Do you remember? What did you do? So we often ask that kind of a question to try to get descriptions of actions in sequence in a physical setting. So then... How did you respond? What did you do? This particular person said, well, uh, I, I don't remember. And then said, well, I, I backed up down the hallway. I was, I was backing up down the hallway. Uh, and I, so I asked, you know, where were you going? And they said, well, I didn't want the kids to hear, which is important information, because now you're getting a description from the parent of protective behavior on their part. And then they said, well, I was backing up to the kitchen. I said, well, why the kitchen? They said, well, my neighbor Diane knows um, what my partner's like. And um, so I knew that if I got into the kitchen and uh, I left the window open, I got the window open, I, you know, that maybe Diane would hear and she might call the cops. So how the person manages the social and the physical setting is extremely important, particularly in single incident assaults, rapes. Uh, armed robberies, gang beatings, and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, if you're in a busy nightclub um, and, um, you know, there are 200 people around and someone attacks you, you might fight back physically because there are 200 people there who might intervene to help you. If, on the other hand, you're completely isolated in a parking lot at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, you might turtle. You might just cover your head and try to protect yourself, and that would be the most appropriate response in that context. So when we start trying to make sense of how people actually respond to violence in the moment and long after we have to take into account the context the life world of the person the social and physical setting and also the nature of the offender's actions so and the social network and institutional responses social network and institutional responses this refers to how your friends your family the police the child protection folks your neighbor your colleagues um, the Crown Prosecutor, etc. How do they respond to your account of what happened to you? Um, are you believed? Are you treated with respect and dignity? Uh, are you asked good questions? That is, are you interviewed in a competent manner? Um, <clears throat> is key information um, paid attention to? Um, and if not, um, if you don't get adequate social network and institutional responses, people tend to experience much greater distress. Uh, give you an example, Jen, uh, an Indigenous girl who's 14 years old, she phoned, um, uh, phoned the police when her father assaulted her mother um, particularly badly. Her father had been assaulting her mother periodically uh, ever since Jen could remember. However, she'd never called the police before. So she phoned the police. The police came. They arrested. Uh, they took him away. They put him in cells. They charged. And as is required in BC, at least, they called the child protection people. The child protection folks came along and decided that Jen's mother was not protective enough, uh, so they removed Jen uh, from her mother. They put her in a foster home, happened to be with uh, European descended folks who asked questions like, you know, I mean, the residential schools, that was a long time ago. What What is it with, I mean, why can't you folks kind of, let, let's move on, let's get over it. And so she was getting this kind of inappropriate uh, racist sort of um, comments, um, but 
she was really distressed. She wanted to get back to see her mother. The child protection worker didn't want her to go back and see her mother because the logic was the mother would uh, was unable to protect her from her father who had been released on conditions. And uh, so she started running away, then she was picked up and she was brought back to the foster home and then she stopped eating anything they cooked. Uh, and then she was uh, sent to a psychologist because she was really struggling and the psychologist decided that she was traumatized and she had problems with self-regulation. Um, at that point, Jen started cutting uh, quite severely. Uh, so at that point, she was referred to our, our group. We met with her and we learned uh, in the first interview that the reason she wanted to get back to her mother was that um, and the reason she had phoned police this time is that just prior to the assault, she had overheard her mother. She had stayed home from school secretly and was sitting in her bedroom. Her mother didn't know that. And um, she stayed home from school because she was worried about her mother. And she overheard her mother having a phone call with uh, her sister, that is Jen's aunt. And she overheard her mom saying, I can't tolerate this anymore. Uh, I can't go on. When I'm gone, will you take care of Jen? So Jen was worried that her mother was going to commit suicide. So in this context, cutting uh, is understandable, less as self-harming and more as a form of protest, not only against the violence, but against problematic institutional responses. Uh, another example, if you're Tim and you're an eight-year-old boy and your father's favorite brother, your uncle, um, is molesting you when he comes to babysit, you may not want to tell your father or your mother because, you know, your uncle is your father's favorite brother. You don't want to hurt your father and you also don't know if you're going to be believed. And, um, you know, fighting back physically against your uncle when he molests you is not an option for obvious reasons, so what do you do? So Tim would wear three pairs of pajamas when he went to bed at night. Um, he'd make himself physically sick whenever the uncle came over. Whenever the uncle came over and babysat and cooked, he would refuse to eat any of the food. He refused ever to have his photograph taken with his uncle. So there were a number of things that he was doing indirectly behind the scenes that once you understood the context were understandable as forms of resistance to the violence. So this is something like a fact pattern. If you look at our interviews with people in different contexts, you'll find we get all of this information in the intake. So, And often the first questions we begin to talk with people about are, who else knows about this? Have you told anybody else? Um, why did you tell your brother and not your sister? Um, when you told your brother, how did he respond? Uh, did he listen to you? And, um, you know, when you were believed, what difference did that make to you? And Or when the person didn't seem to want to hear what you were saying, what difference did that make to you? So we often talk about social network and institutional responses first because it creates safety and also because it gives you a sense of okay, what kinds of questions might I want to ask or want to stay away from with this person? What's their level of comfort? If they have been, if they've received negative responses from institutional actors previously, they may be very reluctant to talk with you. And so that needs to be respected and understood, not seen as a problem. So if you're asking about those social institutional responses initially, that often gives you very important information. Okay. Here's an example of what we mean by resistance. This is from Sweden. A researcher called Carolina Overlane has been talking with children in uh, the context of transition houses, uh, women's shelters. So it's a context where uh, virtually every case is the, the kind of uh, stereotypical heterosexual example of men's violence against women uh, and children. So Carolina is asking Karen, can I ask in those situations when you were scared and felt like something was wrong, did did you feel like you could do something then? Karen says, no, that was the thing. I, I was so little and had so many feelings. Sometimes I could say to daddy, please dad, be quiet. Don't be bothered by, my, by what mommy says. I played along with him for a while and played along with him and thought this will help and pretended that mommy was the one who was sick. So I said that if you could only be quiet, don't be bothered by what she's saying, you know, she's wrong. So be quiet and go outside and be angry. You can see here that this is an example of a girl, and Karn's 15, but she's talking about when she was younger. How complex is this behavior to pretend to side with father, to try to manage him in order to covertly, secretly protect your mother? What kind of 
competency and capacity, what kind of awareness, what kind of skill um, and acumen would she have to have in order to engage in that sort of complex behavior. But once you see how young people begin to try to respond and resist, protect other people, protect themselves, manage people who are offending, you, you can begin to get a, a picture of competencies, um, capabilities, awareness, strengths of spirit, and so forth that you wouldn't otherwise see. So you can ask, wow, even if you were so terrified, you were so worried about what your father was going to do, you managed to remain calm and try to help your mom. How did you do that? Uh, and does your mom know how hard you've been trying to protect her? And if she did know, what difference would it make to her? So you can begin to then develop an interviewing practice that builds on the already existing responses and forms of resistance from the child or from the person. This is an example of um, uh, another case, a, a boy called Lars, who's eight years old. Uh, he's talking to a therapist called Lotte Malander, um, and this is on a DVD made by Unison, the, um, the largest uh, women and girls serving agency in Sweden. Um, I'm sending a copy of the DVD and the transcript of it to, um, to Pearl. So, um, um, you know, and I, I'm happy to send other people copies if they like. Uh, Unison makes it available free of charge. So the therapist is talking to Lars. Do you remember him hitting mummy? Definitely, says Lars. Did that happen a lot? Yes, it was always in the evening. Where would you be? So you notice in this kind of interviewing, and we find this as well with kids, with young people, the discussion about physical space makes things concrete. Where were you? Where were they? What were you doing? And so forth. Um, we find that if we talk about the concrete physical space and actions first, then it's easier for, sh for children to talk about their subjective experience, what they were feeling, what they were thinking. If you start talking about what they were feeling and thinking before grounding it in the physical realities, it's harder for young people to talk about emotions and thoughts. It's too abstract for them. So Lars says, this is the living room and this is my bedroom. My bed is here and they'd be fighting right here. They didn't think about the fact that I'd wake up. Uh, you never went to your sister's rooms, says the therapist. No, I couldn't. They were on the second floor. They would have heard me from the living room. I'd hear them and go say, mommy, Someone has thrown eggs at the window. So you interrupted them. Yes, other times I said I had a bad dream. That was the best trick to make them stop. Mummy would come into my room and sleep in my bed. I like that. And where would your stepdad be? He'd stay outside. So you helped solve the problem. Yes, that was very clever of you. Thanks. I think you'll become an inventor. Yes, that's what I want to be, says Lars. So again, you can see very simple, concrete, straightforward, getting actions in a sequence in a physical and physical context uh, over time. And then you begin to see how Lars was managing the circumstances. And now you can ask, what other kinds of tricks did you use to protect your mommy, Lars? Uh, and to get mommy away from your stepdad? Did anybody notice? How did you stop them from noticing? What about your little sister? Did you ever do things to take care of your little sister? And so forth. And so you would begin to build up an account with Lars. So Lars would begin to have the sense, oh, it, it's not just that this just happened and it was terrible and horrible, but I did whatever I could. I did things uh, to try to solve the situation. You know, I think it's extremely important for everyone to have a sense that they did what they could in the circumstances. Uh, this is just the reference uh, which you have in the, in the PowerPoint presentation to the uh, DVD I was mentioning. Here's a different kind of example from Maria, who is a research participant with an organization in uh, uh, Sydney, Australia that we've been working with, Domestic Violence Services Management. Um, and Maria says, when he, that is my husband, knew I was pregnant, he beat me to a pulp and I miscarried twice. Publicly, he'd be saying to friends that he wanted to have kids. When I suspected I was pregnant again, I hid it from him. I produced the pregnancy test with him and my mom in the same room. I knew that if the pregnancy was public and that, he, and that he would have to go along with it and this would keep my daughter safe. Mom took a photo of us with the pregnancy test. It was public. I had been able to manage his violence towards me, not accept it, but manage it. So for the nine months I was pregnant, the physical violence stopped. So here you see an example of someone having to 
use a very intelligent strategy um, in order to manage an unmanageable situation. So again, you can now reflect back, okay, I, I can see that you were protecting your child right from the get-go. Um, you and your mom worked out a plan, obviously. How long had your mom known about your partner being abusive? In what other ways had you and your mom worked together? Who else knows? So you, you begin, when you're asking these kinds of questions based on this information, you're beginning to really take apart the very commonly held stereotypes of, about women who are abused by men, such as they're passive or they learn to be helpless um, or they go along with it or they attract abusive guys or they lack self-esteem or they lack boundaries and so forth, uh, all of which, uh, all of those kind of common assumptions that are not supportable uh, when you engage in any careful analysis of these cases. So resistance is ever present. Where there is violence, there is resistance. Petite acte de la vie, I guess you would say en français. Resistance can be open and direct or subtle and disguised, depending on the dangers and opportunities of specific situations. Open defiance is the least common form of resistance. The word resistance is often connected with physically fighting back, but for many people, escaping mentally, uh, subtly uh, protecting other people, um, is the most uh, common form and the most important form of resistance because open defiance is often met with even more brutal violence uh, in retaliation. So you'll often find that victims also conceal their resistance because if the perpetrator knew about their resistance, they would be subjected to even more violence. And finally, res resistance is a response to violence, not an effect or an impact of violence. I'm not going to talk about this today um, because of shortage of time, but what this actually means is that when you want to learn about how people have resisted violence, you have to ask different questions. In psychology and psychiatry, um, most of the language used to talk about victims is how they're affected and impacted. But resistance is a response. It's not an effect and it's not an impact. It's a cry from the heart. It's an action from the person. It's immediate and it's also longer term. So when we started trying to learn how people resisted violence, we found we had to ask questions about how people had responded. Uh, immediately, it could be physically, socially. Uh, we would ask questions like, so when you could see that this was not going well, or when you could see that he was about to come after you, or they were about to come after you, how did you respond? Do you remember what did you do? Or how did you respond? Do you remember what was going on in your mind? Or how did you respond? Do you remember uh, what was your body telling you? You can ask the question in many different kinds of ways. We tend to ask initially, um, how, did, how did you respond? You know, what did you do? Because we want to track action, behavior in the context of we, if we possibly can. But you can shift to those other arenas, subjective experience, overt behavior as well, depending on your purposes, what kind of work you're doing, whether or not you need to get, uh, gather evidence for criminal proceedings or whether or not you're working as a counselor or a social worker and you want to highlight protective behavior. So violence is social in that there are at least two people involved, uh, a perpetrator and a victim we normally call them. Uh, it follows that complete and accurate descriptions will include the actions of both people in context. Just in case you're wondering, we use the word victim um, for the reason that the word victim, unlike the word survivor, denotes that a crime has been committed. Um, it's extremely important to keep that in front of us. You can survive an earthquake, uh, but if you're subjected to rape, for example, you're a victim, someone has deliberately harmed you, uh, and it's illegal, it's a crime, and it's important to keep that in front of us. So in order to illustrate w w the importance of this point, I'm going to give you two different descriptions of the same sexual assault, and it's a stranger assault. So uh as you as you know stranger assaults are the least common stranger rapes are the least common form of rape but this gives us a good um way of making the contrast between descriptions so the first description you can see i won't read it but you can see that it um it describes the offender's actions in this case a he and if you look at the grammar he followed her he sped up he overpowered her in grammar, we, these are subject, verb, object sentences. They're active constructions. So you really get a sense of who did what to whom, and the verbs followed, through, 
overpowered, threatened, etc., cetera, uh, are transitive or active verbs in that they convey force upon the object. At the same time, you're getting, while well, you're getting a fairly strong description in good grammar of the offender's actions, you obviously know nothing about the victim. The victim in this case could be uh, unconscious for all we know. So here's the second description, which uh, in red, all I've done is inserted the victim's responses. And this is cobbled together from my notes of working for the woman in this case about seven years after the rape took place. She got a very good response from police. Um, you know, the guy, the offender was uh, arrested, charged, convicted, uh, did some jail time. Um, however, for many years after, she had been occasionally really deeply troubled about it and would sink into a pretty dark place and start questioning, you know, why, did I, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Like many victims do. Um, so uh, when I had a conversation with her about this, I just asked her lots of questions in detail about going through the attack, how she actually responded at different points. So all the information in red are her responses. Uh, she sped up, she moved to the side, she averted her face as we go down, and you can see. So you may agree that all of the information in red um, are, is understandable as her responses and her forms of resistance in that context. So stopping screaming is just as important a form of resistance as screaming. You'll, be able, you'll see that she fought back physically, but she also tried to reason with him. You don't want to do this. You don't want to hurt me. So in other words, it wasn't just an amygdala hijack where she dissociated uh, uh, or what have you, and did various things. She tried to do a whole number of things in a sequence over time uh, and was unable to stop the attack. And so as she was more and more violated, more and more threatened, she had to resort to different kinds of tactics in her response. Ultimately, she went limp to avoid injury and went elsewhere in her mind. When I asked her uh, about uh, when she said she averted her face, um, I said, you know, she said at one point, he, he tried to kiss me. So I said, kiss you, you know, a kiss is something two people want to do together. It's mutual, it's consensual, it's pleasant, ideally. Um, what do you mean kiss? Did you want to kiss? And she said, no, of course I didn't want to kiss. So what did he do then? And she said, well, he, he forced his mouth on my face. So, which I thought was a perfect physical description. So I wrote that down, um, and then I said, when he did that, how did you respond? And when I asked her that question, um, she kind of physically turned her head, kind of remembering what she did. She averted her face. And when she did that, she just stopped, uh, started crying, her breathing changed. Uh, we sat there for quite a while. And then I asked her, uh, what happened? Um, what, what, were you, what were you recalling there? And she said, well, now I know why I stopped fighting. And uh, I said, why is that? And she said, because when I turned my face, she said, I forgot about this, but when I turned my face, there were two girls walking down the sidewalk, just like, I don't know, 30, 40 feet away. So in fact, what had happened is she stopped screaming because she did not want to att attract the attention of these girls because she was worried about them. So in the middle of being attacked, she was protecting other people. And I have to say, this is not at all uncommon. You know, um, how many babysitters, when the drunk parent comes home from work uh, or comes home after a night of drinking, uh, how many babysitters are sexually assaulted and don't scream uh, because they don't want to wake up the kids? It's not at all uncommon even to find young children when they're assaulted protecting other young children. So the strategies of violence, the strategies used by the perpetrator are tied to the tactics of resistance by the victim. Perpetrators of violence know that victims will resist. They take account of the nature of victims' resistance in the way that they commit violence. So how we understand the victim's resistance hinges on the strategies of violence used by the perpetrator. If the offender tries to isolate the victim, anything the victim does to break out of isolation and remain connected with other people is a form of resistance. If the offender tries to humiliate the victim, anything the victim does to preserve or reassert their dignity is a form of resistance. If the offender tries to conceal the violence, anything the victim does to expose or reveal the violence is a form of resistance, etc.
this is the the logic of this is extremely important. The Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter, uh, Quest, has a really good document that summarizes this way of thinking. Um, you can get it from their website. Uh, it's called Honoring Honoring Resistance, and they give that material to the women who uh, attend the shelter. Not sure if you can hear that, but there's sirens outside my window here. So. Uh, we're, uh, what I'm saying is that resistance is as real as violence. I'm, it's not just a reframe. I'm not, we're not trying to be strengths-based. Uh, we're not just trying to track resilience. Uh, many of the ways in which people resist don't look like resilience. Cutting, for example. Few people would call cutting a mark of resilience, but clearly for some people uh, it's a form of protest, a form of uh, resistance. And a few people would call it a strength. So we're, I'm not describing a strengths-based or a resilience-based uh, approach, and nor is it an effort to be positive. Uh, the victim's resistance most directly reveals the deliberate nature of the violence. This is an extremely important point because when you don't see how the victim resisted, as in here, you don't see all the steps taken by the perpetrator to overcome and suppress that resistance necessarily. And the more deliberate aspects of the violence then tend to disappear. If it looks to uh, a defense counsel, the defense counsel for the accused in a rape case, if there is no accounting of the victim's resistance, as in this description here, defense counsel is um, empowered to ask, well, Mrs. Jones, if this was so horrible, why did you not fight back? So the absence of the victim's resistance tends to be used against the victim uh, and to benefit the perpetrator or the accused. Okay. I'm not going to shift uh, to talk about language, the connection between language and violence. Um, we've been studying the connection between language and violence for quite a long period of time. We've been looking at court documents, judges' reasons for sentencing, police interviews, child protection interviews, media, criminal codes, and so on. So I'm just going to take you briefly through um, a couple of points about the way we do this analysis and make a distinction between mutual actions and unilateral actions. Uh, that is based on the work of Linda Coates, and then see where this analysis uh, takes us. We, there are commonly used false terms um, that are uh, we see often. Comfort women, these are Korean women who were abducted and uh, imprisoned and raped repeatedly, repeatedly by Japanese soldiers in the Second World War. They were called comfort women. Settlement, uh, a bunch of Europeans show up at the Red River. They, they divide the territory into real estate uh, sections. Uh, they starve the indigenous people. They deliberately kill the buffalo. This is called settlement. Abusive relationships. And this is a common term. If one person is abusing another person, it's not an abusive relationship. Number one, a relationship cannot abuse another person. It takes a person to do the abusing. And so when you call it an abusive relationship, you're implying that both people are being abusive. If I asked you to describe what is a loving relationship? You would instinctively want to tell me what two people do to create the loving. And if I say what's an abusive relationship, you instinctively want to tell me what two people do to create the abuse. So we, this term is inherently victim blaming. Um, if it's a case where one person has been abusive to another, it's not an abusive relationship. It might be a relationship in which one partner has abused another, but it's not an abusive relationship. Unwanted intercourse, we see this in a variety of locations. Oops. Um, if it's intercourse, it's mutual and consensual. It's not unwanted. If it's unwanted, then it can't be intercourse. It could be rape or sexual assault, but it's not intercourse. Sex with a minor, uh, the Criminal Code of Canada, stipulates that if you're 15 and younger, with two exceptions based on age, you cannot consent to sex. Therefore, it's impossible for an adult to have sex with a minor or for a minor to have sex with adult. Yet you often see this term. And same with child prostitution. Uh, if you're 15 and younger, you cannot be said to be engaged in sex um, because you are unable to consent according to the criminal code. So child prostitution, child pornography, um, et cetera, um, sex with a minor, these actions are in principle legally and morally impossible. They cannot ever occur. What can occur is organized rape of children. Child prostitution cannot occur. So violence is unilateral, and this again goes back to the work of Linda Coates. And uh, if you think about a handshake, 
uh, if you shake hands with another person, it's mutual. You reach out, you extend your hand, you coordinate how tightly you hold the grip. Uh, if you don't hold the grip tightly enough, that's a problem. If you hold on too tight, that's a problem. If your eye contact is too intense while you're shaking hands, that's a problem. If you hold on while the other person is trying to let go of your hand, that's a problem. So a handshake is actually highly coordinated. It's mutual in that the two of us do it together. We agree to do it. We accomplish a handshake jointly. It's a mutual activity. If on the other hand, when you're not looking, I grab your hand and I start waving it around in the air, we're not having a handshake. I'm shaking your hand, but it's not a handshake. We're not doing anything mutual. I'm acting against you unilaterally, treating you as an object. Boxing is another example. Um, you know, a couple of guys uh, with funny looking shorts on and big laced up boots get into a boxing ring with boxing gloves. They agree to beat the snot out of each other. There's a referee, there's rules, it's in a ring. It's a mutual agreed upon activity. Then um, Mike Tyson decides to bite the ear off of Vander Holyfield. The mutual act of boxing is now changed to the unilateral act of assault. If I was to call that a boxing match that got out of hand, I would be implying that Evander Holyfield also got out of hand. And he didn't. He simply tried to defend himself. Likewise, if I call a domestic violence assault, if I call a intimate partner assault, an argument that got out of hand, I'm making it mutual. With one person's assault of the other, to attribute the violence to, the, to an argument is to mutualize the violence and to begin to blame the victim. Kissing is uh, obviously a mutual consensual activity. If you think about all the detail involved in um, kissing another human, some of you, some of you may remember the first time you had that experience. Uh, you know where you weren't so good at it, but you know you're, you're, you have that eye contact and your mouths come together and you figure out your glasses and your arms and your all, all of this. Your mouths come together. And then you still have things to figure out, don't you? You know, what kind of kiss will this be? Will it be a sexy kiss? Will it be a friendly kiss? So let's say one person wants a friendly kiss, but the other person wants a sexy kiss. So one person might open their mouth and offer their tongue. The other person doesn't want that, you know, not so much. So what they would do is keep their mouth closed. It's the job of the other person who wanted the sexy kiss now to close their mouth and disengage. That's called consent. And consent is organized on an ongoing basis um, over time. So if one person says, no, I don't want this kiss, and they keep their mouth closed, and the other person tries to shove their tongue into the mouth of the other person and slobber on their cheeks, it's not a kiss. However, we found in some of the early analysis we did of judges' reasons for sentencing in sexual assault cases that judges often uh, referred to forced oral contact, that is, when an adult forced their mouth onto the body of a child, they often referred to that as kissing. They referred to forced anal penetration as anal intercourse. They refers to, referred to forced vaginal penetration as sex with a child, things that impossible cannot occur. So we find often in forensic, but also other settings, that the distinction between mutual actions and unilateral actions is lost, and authorities transform violence against children into sex with children. So as an anonymous Canadian genius said, I read this in the Globe and Mail 25 years ago and I've never been able to find it again. If you hit someone on the head with a frying pan, you don't call it cooking. I think that makes sense. Um, this analysis, by the way, is used in uh, working with young people in the Yukon and Watson Lake for, with the Casca folks. They have a program called Youth for Safety and Justice in which they teach young people this analysis of violence and they absolutely love it uh, in fact, they petitioned uh, Prime Minister Trudeau to change the language of the criminal code, uh, which we'll come to in a minute. Car theft is not auto sharing. Bank robbery is not a financial transaction. Uh, similarly, wife assault is not a dispute or an argument or an abusive relationship. Child rape is not sex with a child or child prostitution. So on the left, you have unilateral terms that convey force upon the victim. He forced his mouth onto hers, gets called a kiss. Wife assaults and beatings get called abusive relationships. Forced vaginal penetration gets called sex and intercourse. Uh, invasion, genocide, um, to, to uh, my great embarrassment as a Canadian, uh, in the non-apology apology by Prime Minister Harper, uh, 
the genocide by Europeans against indigenous people in Canada was called our historical relationship problem. Um, how's that for mutualizing? And international child rape gets called sex tourism or sex with minors. Here's an example from colonial discourse. Um, uh, this is an older version, but um, coloni colonization has always been based upon the existence of need and dependency. Not all people are suitable for being colonized. Only those who feel this need are suitable. In almost all cases where Europeans have founded colonies, we can say that they were expected and even desired in the unconscious of their subjects. So this creates the image of indigenous people standing around the rim of Canada waiting for Europeans to show up. You know, gee, I sure hope those Europeans show up. I've got a powerful need to be colonized going on over here. And I know that because my therapist told me. So it's, it's absurd, but it, it, it shows us, it reveals to us a certain way of thinking of mutualizing violence and blaming the oppressed for wanting to be abused. The same logic is entailed in the cycle theory of violence, the original cycle theory of violence, explosion, honeymoon, tension building, and so forth, which is still widely used in many countries and is profoundly victim blaming. Here's another example from uh, recent literature which conveys the same logic as, as col the colonial discourse example. Um, the partner's characteristics hold them together. As abused partners adapt and become more compliant, the partner's characteristics make them increasingly dependent on one another. After prolonged abuse, they develop complementary characteristics. He's aggressive, she's passive. He's demanding, she's compliant. He's blaming, she's accepting guilt. You see the logic here. If you weren't so passive, they wouldn't be so aggressive. If you weren't so compliant, they wouldn't be so demanding. If you weren't so accepting of guilt, they wouldn't be so blaming. So again, we try to explain violence by an offender by some deficiency in the actions of, of the victim. Uh, and the logic is, is very strange. It's like saying, you know, if you weren't so black, I wouldn't be so racist. If you weren't so queer, I wouldn't hate you so much. Um, you know, if you weren't so disabled, I wouldn't make fun of you. So it, it, I mean, it's very strange. And this way of talking, you can see, reflects this way of thinking. So for me, this is the intersection of misogyny and colonial discourse. And we find it all over the place in the interpersonal violence field. Uh, Linda Coates and I did some analysis of emergency protection order conversations in the Northwest Territories a few years ago. We looked at how justices of the peace interviewed people who had, were phoning in. In our data set, they were all Indigenous women who were phoning in to get an emergency protection order. So we did a line-by-line -line analysis of a number of recorded uh, interviews. Here's one example of what I'm talking about. The court is saying, Okay, and right from the start, he's been aggressive and sexually abusive. The applicant, a woman, indigenous woman in this case. No, he was okay till August, and then one night we started to kiss, and then I wasn't, I didn't want to, and then he didn't listen. And then her voice trails off as she's describing him assaulting her. Okay, was that reported to police? She says, no. No, now was that then, was that then the first time you two had relations, had sex? That was the first time I've ever had sex. So what you have here is a powerful, educated, European-descended person turning rape against an Indigenous woman into sex with an Indigenous woman. It wasn't sex. It was, it was assault. And my experience has been over the years, when we confuse sex and violence, we make recovery from the violence much more difficult because the meaning of it um, is confused and the victim is left with questions about, well, if I had sex, what does that mean? Do I have a problem with sex? Um, and so when we're confusing sex and violence, when we're working with young people, uh, I think we make their recovery much more difficult and we also induce a sense of blame and shame as though they somehow contributed or to or participated in wrongful sex. Criminal Code of Canada does the same thing Invitation to sexual touching, section 152. Every person who, for a sexual purpose, invites, counsels, etc. So I'm an adult and I trap a child in a closet in the school when everyone's gone home after basketball practice. And I, I grab the body of the child and I get them to grab my body or I force them to touch my body. And we call that invitation to sexual touching. Well, it's not an invitation, it's coercion. There's nothing sexual about it. It's purely and inherently violent. And it's not just touching, it's grabbing, it's molesting, 
So we take three positive terms, invitation to sexual touching. An invitation is a positive thing. You invite friends for coffee. Sex is a positive thing. Touching is something neutral or positive. I went to a movie. It was very touching. I'm touching the table at this time. So we take three neutral positive terms, slam them together uh, in a way that profoundly conceals the nature of the violence at question. Uh, this, for me, um, is an evidence of collusion in the Criminal Code of Canada with people who perpetrate these crimes. Uh, it's such a profoundly distorted description, it's shocking, except that it occurs in other criminal codes uh, in other countries as well. We're doing an analysis of criminal codes. So here's um, an example from Washington State. A person's guilty of rape of a child in the second degree when the person has sexual intercourse with another who is at least 12 years old, less than 14. So the point is you cannot have sexual intercourse with a person who cannot consent. You can attack them, you can force your penis into their body, but you cannot have sexual intercourse with them legally or illegally. It simply cannot occur. New Zealand, section 132, sexual conduct with a child under 12. Well, there can be no sexual conduct because a child cannot consent. So therefore it cannot be sexual. Notice they're talking about conduct, which is a neutral word. There's positive and there's negative conduct. Everyone who has a sexual connection with a child, sexual connection with a child. How can you have a sexual connection with a child? So what we're actually doing, because criminal codes are expected to be a standard of objectivity, our criminal codes are profoundly confusing the public in a way that further harms victims and benefits perpetrators. We need to change our criminal code immediately. Here's an example from a news program um, that was on a little while ago, CTV News, uh, Kevin Newman, um, and uh, a journalist called Victoria Potashnik. They were talking about the problem uh, problems in Winnipeg with uh, prostitution, they were calling it, and um, Victoria Potashnik had said, yeah, this problem is, the, the problem is a lot younger these days. Child prostitutes are on many street corners. They, inter they didn't interviewed a woman, uh, blackened out on the screen, who identified as a prostitute. Um, the journalist asked, how did you get started in this work? She says, well, I was 12 years old and my neighbor took me into the back room of this house and bent me over a table and did me from behind. Then he threw 50 bucks at me. And that was my first sexual experience. And that's when it started. So, of course, it was not a sexual experience. It was a profoundly violent, humiliating experience. But as long as we, in authoritative circumstances in criminal codes, in psychological reports, in forensic assessments, in testimony in courts, uh, in the media, as long as we refer to violence as sex, we are creating public confusion. Uh, so of course, this is going to diminish the effectiveness of all, our, all intervention programs and all prevention programs. Uh, one of the key things we need to do is clearly differentiate between violence and sex in every case where it's possible, and particularly where it concerns children. So where there's violence or any humiliation of dignity, there's resistance. Uh, resistance is a response, not an effect. However, thanks to the focus on effects and impacts, resistance is widely concealed or ignored. Who is asking, what is the dignity center of the brain? How do children protect loved ones even when they're terrified? The new trauma-informed practice, which has become kind of the flavor um, these days, does not adequately convey the complex nature of responses and resistance. So, of course, the wrong questions are being asked of the brain. Consequently, victims are portrayed as passive and dysfunctional, even as attracting or going along with the violence they endure. Mutual language, confusing sex and violence, changing a, an assault into a fight or a conflict, further conceals victim resistance and perfect perpetrators' efforts to overcome and suppress that resistance. So here's an example of really, I think, really clear uh, language use. A group of um, activists in the Yukon connected with Kayushi's place, uh, the women's shelter there, um, um, put together an anti-rape campaign that makes a really good use of language. Renee Claude Carrier, the... Um, associate director there and some colleagues developed these scenarios which were read on the radio by young women. Um, I asked you to stop. I tried to negotiate. I screamed for help. I turned my face away from yours. I crossed my legs. I stuck out my stomach. I clutched a tree. 
Then I went limp to avoid the pain and went to a safe place in my head. Do you really question my resistance? The judge decided I consented. Nobody asks to be raped. Stand with us for dignity and nonviolence. So what changes uh, when we work with people in a way that acknowledges their responses and their resistance? They move from passive and affected to active and responding, from the object position to the subject position, from I'm incapable to I'm competent, from I have no boundaries to they ignored my boundaries, from I need skills to I responded skillfully, from I'm hypervigilant to I have good radar, from I'm depressed to I'm sad at being oppressed, from I'm responsible to the offender is responsible, from I failed to I did what I could, from I let it happen to I couldn't make it stop, from I went along with it to I opposed it, from I choose abusive guys to I choose decent guys, from I reenacted my trauma to I reenacted my resistance, from I'm sick and abnormal to I'm normal and healthy, from I'm odd and pathological to I'm understandable and sensible, from I'm the problem to violence is the problem, from I have an inner problem to this is a social problem, from self-doubt and blame to self-respect. So I just want to say thanks to everybody um, for your inviting me uh, to um, present this uh, short webinar. And I guess now what we're going to do is uh, look to questions. I'm hoping I'm able to make this happen. Oh, by the way, I've given you a couple of handouts, Becoming Better Helpers, and an example from the Vancouver Sun, and there's some articles as well you might like to look at. Uh, Becoming Better Helpers is, um, you, you can see the full reference to the article. I'd, uh, it, it's really, really nice work, and you can see the difference in language use they've been able to identify. So I'm now going to try to uh, get a hold of, get in, go to the questions, if there are any. Okay, so I don't see any questions. I hope I'm not missing any. So apparently either no one has attended <laughs> or um, I've explained everything so beautifully that there are no questions. Ah. Yes, a uh, question about, at the beginning of the presentation, you talked about prostitution and so-called sex workers. I understand that sex workers themselves identify as sex workers. Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. Many sex workers do. Many people uh, involved in that kind of activity identify as sex workers and absolutely um, have the right and should have the right to identify in the way that best suits them. Um, other people identify as engaged in prostitution or as prostituted people. And this conversation is extremely important because, you know, on the one hand, um, there's extremely high levels of violence in so-called prostitution uh, or in so-called sex work. Um, but who gets to talk about what the nature of the activity is? It's quite possible, for example, I think, to talk about why it's important for some sex workers to identify as sex workers and at the same time to not conceal the violence committed by Johns or so-called sex buyers in many cases. My concern is that if we, if we don't talk about the violence, um, uh, we're, actually, um, we're actually permitting violence. So we need to accord everyone the respect to identify in the way that they want to. But I want to stress that that does not extend to people who are committing violence. If someone to me is raping someone, and they say, yeah, but I want to identify as someone having sex with that child. Um, I don't accept that they have the right to conceal the nature of their behavior in that way. So while we want to accord that dignity and respect to people who identify as sex workers, we don't apply the same logic to people who have committed violence, nor should we, in my view. Have I ever testified before Parliament um, about changing the language of the criminal code? No, I have not. Um, I think... Um, it would be wonderful if we had the opportunity to do that. Um, 
uh, I think Linda Coates would be um, an ideal person to do that as well. Uh, and I think actually that needs to happen. Um, there's been evidence of this problematic language for many years. What would need to happen to change the language in the criminal code? I think we have to have a public conversation about it. Um, we have to challenge media accounts. Uh, we have to do more research on legal discourse and examine the kinds of cases where problematic language is used. Um, one of the most important things that Linda Coates did early on was show that actually the way that judges use language was a better predictor of sentencing than was the nature of the crime. We're now finished and we can't go overtime. Thank you again, everybody. Bye for now. Please get in touch if you feel like it.